John chapter 9, we're going to begin with verse 1. John chapter 9 says, As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked, Why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so that the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the task assigned by us, assigned us by the one who sent, who sent us. The night is coming, and then no one can work. But while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. Then he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, go wash, your, go wash yourself in the pool of Salome. And if you look, Salome means sent. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. His neighbors and others who knew him as the blind beggar asked each other, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, he was, and others said, no, he looks just like him. But the beggar kept saying, yes, I am the same one. They asked, who healed you? What happened? He told them, the man they called Jesus made mud and spread it over my eyes and told me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went and washed, and now I can see. But I come to you today uh, somewhat exhausted. Uh, it has been a long season in my life. I, no, I'm not talking about the fact that I, I got up, left the house at 7 o'clock on Friday, did not get into Liberty till about 5.15, and then immediately taught the partnership class, and then got up and taught the partnership class and did all that stuff. No, it's been a long season in my life because God has decided, for whatever reason, that he is not going to let me rest on my laurels. He is not going to let me accept the status quo that he's constantly challenging me he's constantly asking me to do new and hard things difficult things things that i never thought or imagined that i would be doing and what i have noticed though is when i talk to the lord about it he says randy i ask everybody to do this there's just so many people that say no i was thinking at christmas did you ever ask yourself at christmas i wonder how many young virgins said no to the angels whenever he came up and offered for them to be the mother of the christ I wonder how many young teenage girls said no to that angel, and he, he had to keep going, and finally he found one in Mary that would say, yes, yes, Lord. My great concern for some of you is that you're going to get to the end of your life, you're going to stand before God, and you're not going to be thinking about his goodness, you're not going to be thinking about his grace, you're not going to be thinking about what he did for you on Easter. What you're going to be thinking about is all the times, like the children of Israel, you got to the edge of your promised land and you said no. You said, I'm not going to do it. It's too hard. It's too difficult. It's out of my comfort zone. I'm just not going to do it. And that's my great concern for so many of you is that God keeps offering you the abundant life. God keeps offering you a new life, a better life, a different life, a life where you are forced to rely upon him, trust him, lean on him, not your own understanding. And y'all just simply look at the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who bought you, who died for you, who saved you, and just say no. I'm not going to do it. Oh, God, have mercy on us. Oh, God, give us another chance. Oh, God, may we not have to eat our consequences. And so when, as I was praying about all this today, as I was thinking about all of this today, I was reminded of something that you probably won't hear from most pulpits. Most of you aren't shocked. If you've been here more than 15 minutes, you understand that most of the things that you have you hear from this pulpit uh, are things that you haven't heard. I, I had a, a man that used to come here. He was an elder in the Methodist church. He was a lay pastor. He was a, he was a teacher. He had been in church all of his life, but yet he spent five years, and every time he walked out the door and he spoke to me, he had tears in his eyes, and he said this, I never knew. Randy, how come I never knew what you taught me today? I don't know why you don't know. Could be you. Could be your leadership could be this world, I don't know. But today, we're going to talk about something that most, all, most people are not willing to talk about in the church. Why? Because it's one of the embarrassments of Christianity. We are embarrassed by what I'm getting ready to talk about. The, the church is embarrassed by it. Oh, we love to talk about the goodness of God, the grace of God, the, the, the love of God. We love to talk about the abundant life and how God saves us for good things and, and all this stuff. But we don't like to consider this fact. 
And the fact is this. Sometimes life stinks. Sometimes life stinks. Sometimes you get to the end of the month, and there's more month than there is finances. Sometimes, despite your best efforts to undo all the generational curses of your parents and your grandparents, you get diabetes, you get sickness, you get disease. Sometimes, despite all your best effort, your, your marriage falls apart. Sometimes you can be like God and be the perfect father, and yet you have rebellious children. Sometimes life stinks. Now, here's the thing that may surprise you because most people don't realize this. The Bible isn't afraid to admit it. The Bible isn't afraid to agree with you. You know what? The Bible says over and over again that God agrees with your assessment. Notice what, uh, uh, what Ecclesiastes 2, 22 and 23 ask. It says, what do people get for all of their work and struggle here on earth? All of their lives, their work is full of pain and sorrow. And even at night, their minds don't rest. Now, I'm not one of those preachers that has to tell you all the context and who the author is, and it was written in 600 B.C. or all this. No, but I will say this. I do find the the author of that verse very interesting. The person who wrote that verse that, guess what? Life is about struggling. Life is full of pain and sorrow, that even at night our minds don't rest. The guy that wrote it was King Solomon. I know you may not know who King Solomon is, but if you do any research, if you do any uh, 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 looking up of him, you'll find that many consider him to be the wisest man on earth and the richest man on earth. And yet, evidently, being the wisest man on earth and the richest man on earth did not keep him from saying, life stinks. Even having all the money, even having all the wisdom, because some of you have always said to yourself, you say, you know, if I was just a little bit smarter, if I just had a little bit more wisdom, if I just got a little bit more expensive, my life would be better. But here is a man considered the widestest and the richest man in history, yet even he recognized the reality of pain and suffering in this life. Now, I know what some of you somewhat pseudo Bible scholars are thinking. Well, Randy, that's for somebody that was born before Jesus. Randy, that doesn't count for, for Christians. You know, Christians are exempt. Christians, we were saved for abundance. We were saved for blessing. We were saved for the good life. Well, notice what Jesus says in John six thirty three: Here on earth, you will, not maybe, here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. You see, I was forced to recognize this. Maybe the reason why I can consider this and not be threatened by it is I was forced to recognize this with my mom. You got to understand, my mom has, had loved the Lord from an early age. She, she went to a Bible preaching church and she fell in love with Jesus and she loved to sing love songs to Jesus. And my mom grew up as a teenager. She did the right thing. She was smart. She was intelligent. She was, she was holy. She was pure. She married my dad. And together, they decided that, you know what, all those generational curses like alcoholism and adultery and, and, and foolishness and drugs, all of those generational curses, we're not going to do. We're not going to follow the paths of our ancestors. And my mom and dad, they decided that they were going to be holy people, righteous people, good people, church people, loving God, loving others. And that's what they did. And then they raised their three boys. They had three boys. And they raised all three boys to, to, to love the Lord and to love others. In fact, they must have done something right because uh, their eldest boy is a missionary and a deacon. Their middle boy is an elder and loves the Lord with all of his heart. And their son, the black sheep of the family, is a preacher. Yet, when my mom was in her 30s, the doctor told her, you've got this thing going on in your eyes that blood, pl blood clots are forming. And they're forming all the time. But one of these days, the blood clot is going to form over your optic nerve, and you're going to go blind. I can't tell you when. I can't tell you how. But it's just going to happen. Prepare yourself. And for the next 15 years, my mom loved every sunset. My mom loved every sunrise. My mom would go to the mountains. My mom would go to the beach. My mom loved God's creation. She was bound and determined if today was to be the day that she went blind, that she was going to have sucked the marrow out of all the visuals of life. And then one day, it happened. It happened to her left eye. She went blind. But she still had her right eye, and it was okay. So she continued to drive. She continued to make the best of it. By the way, nobody knew that her left eye had, been, uh, had gone blind except the family. And then one day, she woke up, and it happened to her right. And my mom was 90% blind. 
she still continued to teach Sunday school. She continued to serve the Lord. She didn't get bitter. She, she got better. Her blindness uh, uh, made her see in ways that most people didn't see. And then something happened. We don't know. My mom, we don't know if she fell. We don't know if it was degenerative. We don't know if it was by, uh, genetic. But my mom's back slowly but surely just started collapsing on itself. And the doctors did 10, 11, 12 surgeries, every time promising, promising, promising that this surgery was going to fix her, that she was going to be pain-free, that she, she was going to be okay. But guess what? While the surgeries may have called, stopped one pain, they caused three others. And don't think for one second that every time she had surgery that the men of God didn't lay hands on her. Don't think for one second that every time she had surgery that the people of God prayed for her. Don't think that every time that she had surgery, my mom and dad were praying together, their families were praying together, and they were crying out to God, oh, God, heal her back. It's bad enough that she's blind. Don't, don't put her in a wheelchair. She ended up in a wheelchair. And then she got dementia. And by the end last six, seven years, I didn't recognize my mom. You see, her story reminds me of Acts 14, 22, where it says we have to suffer a lot before we can get into God's kingdom. I don't know if you've heard that from the pulpit. I don't know if you've read that. Maybe it's one of those verses that you've read, but you glossed over because you don't like what it has to say. And so, if, if, if I haven't convinced you, may this truth settle this for you. Ready? The truth is this. Bad things happen to good people. Bad things happen to good people. And by the way, I know what some of you are doing. You're thinking it's your job to defend God. You're thinking it's your job to, to, to defend God against the mean accusations of the preacher standing on the pulpit. Can I share something with you? If your God is sovereign, which is a fancy way of saying that he's in control, if your God is sovereign, and he's in control, well, how about I put it this way? If I'm walking down the street, street of Asheboro, street of New York, street of Tampa, I'm walking down the street, and I see some woman being raped in an alley, and I walk by, and I have the ability. God has trained me with Krav Maga. He has given me uh, muscles to use. He's given me an opportunity to do something about it. I may not be the biggest man, but I sure am the meanest man. And if I see that woman being raped and I do not stop it, who's responsible? Me. By the way, it's not just me that says that. The law says that. The law says that the cops find out that I had an opportunity to stop that rape and I didn't stop it, then I'm responsible and I can be punished. Well, guess what? God can do anything. God can stop your suffering like that. And God, if God can do something and he doesn't do it, then guess what? He is responsible. And so let's go back again, because I don't think some of you heard me. Bad things happen to good people. In fact, go back to what Paul read earlier. It says in John 9, 2 and 3, it says, Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sin or his parents' sin? Why? What were they doing, by the way? Well, the people of his day had done a wonderful job, maybe like you, maybe like others, the people of that day had done a wonderful job of exempting God for responsibility over the bad things that happened. And so they had decided... That if this dude had been born blind, if my mama went blind, then guess what? Either they had sinned or their parents or their grandparents had sinned. God was no longer in the equation. God was somehow exempt. He was somehow too weak. He was somehow too pathetic to do anything about it. And so that's what they decided. And so that's why it made, it made sense to them. They thought they were asking the obvious question. Hey, hey, Jesus. Why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sin or his parents' sin? And this is what Jesus says. It was not because of his sin or his parents' sin. This happened so that the power of God could be seen in him. Now, I get it. This is one of those hard parts of the Bible. This is another one of those hard verses that we try to ignore. Because think about what Jesus said. This, Jesus declared this man blameless. Jesus declared this, his parents blameless. Like Job, they were declared blameless, yet... He was still blind. But here's the thing. We shouldn't be surprised by that. Why? If you didn't know, may I be the first to tell you. Easter's coming. And while we celebrate Easter, and we think Easter's amazing, you do realize for the first 400 years of Christianity, 
The cross was not a symbol of Christians because we were embarrassed by it. Because if you know anything about the cross, the cross was the cross because Jesus had to be wounded and die for you and for me. I get so, I laugh so much at people wearing the cross on their neck like they're proud of it when it should be a mark of shame because it was your sin that put him on the cross. It was your disgust. It was your mistakes. It was your failures. And so I really don't understand why we act like this is something to brag on when it was our fault. And so here we got Easter coming. And Easter. Easter is the ultimate expression of bad things happening to a good person. Notice what Isaiah says. Isaiah says in 5, 53, 5 and 9, Jesus was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sin. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. And so we shouldn't be surprised about the blind men. We shouldn't be surprised about Job. We shouldn't be surprised about my mama. What we should be doing is this. We should be answering the question according to Scripture, not your opinion. Man, do you realize people are sick and tired of your opinion? They're sick and tired of you telling them what you think. Who are you and why should we care? The real question is, why does God let bad things happen to good people according to Scripture? Why don't we let God tell us why he lets bad things happen to you and me. And so number one, the first thing we see from our story is this, is that God sees the big picture. God sees the big picture. Jesus said the man was blind so that the power of God could be shown in him. Jesus knew that that miracle was going to be put into the Bible, and for thousands of years, people were going to be led to Christ because of what Jesus did to that blind man. I think of the story of Joseph in the old part of the Bible. I don't know if you know that story, but Joseph was kidnapped and sold into slavery by his brothers. It wasn't some enemy. It wasn't some bad guy. It wasn't some evil dude. It wasn't Thanos. It was his brother. His brother sold him into slavery. And what did the Bible say? And God was with him. Oh, you forgot that part, didn't you? And then while he was in slavery, his master's wife wanted to have sex with him. Would have been the smart thing to do economically, legally. It would have been the smart thing for him to do. But Joseph feared God rather than consequences, and he ran from this, this woman who was trying to have sex with him outside of her marriage. Now, you would have think God would have blessed him and showed him great mercy. Nope. What happened? He went to jail. And he was in jail for 12 to 15 years, according to the Bible. But God was with him. And then a famine was coming. What's a famine? A famine when there is, when, is where there is no rain. And guess what? I know you think that all food comes from the grocery stores or Sam's or Walmart, but can I tell you something? When there's no rain, there's no food. There's no food. And so a famine was coming, and, and God warned the king of the land that the famine was coming, and he used Job to help the king understand what was coming. And then miraculously, out of the blue, jo J uh, Joseph woke up one day in prison, and the same day he was number two of the land, he was the vice president of that country. And then he, ha he had a chance to get even with his brothers. He had the power now. They had the power before. He's got the power now. And when they found out who it was, they got scared. But notice what Joseph said in Genesis 50, 20. He says, you, my brothers, intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. So Joseph suffered for 15 to 20 years in order to save millions of people's of lives. Go back to the blind man. Remember what Jesus said. Jesus answered, this happened so that the power of God could be seen in him. You, so you see, I'm firmly convinced if you walked up to that blind man today and said, hey, if you have to be blind for 20 years in order for millions of people to escape hell, in order for millions of people to go to heaven, would you do it again? And he would, he would not even blink. Just like Joseph wouldn't even blink. Just like Jesus didn't even blink. Just like Job didn't even blink. Why? Because they knew that God sees the big picture. But here's what you're thinking. You're saying, but Randy, 
I, I keep asking why, and God never gives me an answer. I keep asking why. I, okay, I, I get it. Joseph's suffering was for this, and, and, and Job's suffering was for that, and, and your mama's suffering was for this. I, I, but, but get Randy, I keep asking what my suffering's for. Well, can I share with you a fact that maybe help you? And the fact is this. God cannot explain everything to us. God cannot explain everything to us. Even go back to Joseph. Do you think God, if God would have gone to Joseph and said, hey, you're, I'm going to need, use you to save somebody in another land, you think he would have been able to understand it as a teenager? Do you think that blind guy, that if God would have, hey, I'm going to whisper, guess some weird dude, this, this preacher, this scraggly preacher, he's going to show up and he's going to heal you and millions of people are going to get saved. You think he could have understood that? You think my mom could have understood how many people's lives were affected by the goodness of God being shown through her suffering? And so that's why God declares in Isaiah 55, 9, for just as the highest heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Think about this for a second. God is juggling billions of people for thousands of years in order to bring his plan into practice. God's juggling billions of people for thousands of years in order to bring about his plan, not your plan, his plan, into, into fruition. Do you think that your pea little brain could understand what's going on all around you? And so some of you remind me of Naomi. Naomi gets so frustrated with me. My, if you don't know, I have a four-year-old, and she thinks she knows everything. Why? Because she hangs out with y'all. Every time she comes here, y'all tell her how great she is, how awesome she is. I mean, by the time I take her back to Florida, her head's about this wide. I won't even fit in the freaking airplane. And so my daughter thinks she knows everything. And so when Daddy comes to her and she says, Daddy, I want an iPad. Hey, Daddy, I want a smartphone. Hey, Daddy, I want a Tesla. Do you think? that I can explain to her. Let me tell you something. I can't. Here's why. Because my dad used to try to explain to me that stuff, and I'd just be sitting there going, when's he going to shut up? I have no idea what he's talking about. And so why do bad things happen to us? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why? Because God knows the big picture. And so that leads us to this truth, and the truth is this. We can trust God's heart when we don't understand his plan. We can trust God's heart when we don't understand his plan. You're saying, Randy, what do you mean God's heart? Oh, were you here when we studied Psalm 103? Because when we studied Psalm 103, if you haven't been, heard the sermons, I would encourage you just to read it. Because in Psalm 103, you're going to hear about God's compassion. You're going to hear about his mercy. You're going to hear about his love. You're going to hear about his forgiveness twice. You're going to hear about God's heart for us. And even though we can't understand everything that he does because he's smarter than we are, we can trust his heart when we don't understand his plan. We can trust Romans 8, 28, when it says, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. You see, even if God has to say no to us, even when God himself brings us suffering, we can trust his heart, even though we don't understand his plan. I think of my dear friend Jason, who's in prison right now. There's no reason for it except God. God picked him up out of his beautiful family with his lovely wife and his 742 kids. God picked him up out of his multi-million dollar business. He pulled him out of that and he stuck him into a prison with 936 people. Why? I don't begin to understand everything, but I will tell you this. Notice what 2 Corinthians 1, 5 says. It says, the more we suffer for Christ, the more Father God will shower us with his comfort through Jesus Christ. So how much comfort do you think Jason is getting? And what does God say later on in that same book? God comforts us so that we can comfort others. You see, why does God let bad things happen to Jason? Why does God let bad things happen to you and me? Because he knows the big picture. But notice number two. 
Why does God let bad things happen to good people? Because God wants us to be like Jesus. God wants us to be like Jesus. Notice what 1 Peter 2, 20 and 21 tells us. It says, if you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in his steps. Now, notice two things about that real quick. It's not going to be on your notes, but I just it, it jumped out at me. Number one, notice that suffering for doing good fulfills God's call on your life. Do you see that? Suffering for doing good fulfills God's call on your life. But there's more. Suffering for doing good is not a sign that God's mad at you. It's actually a sign that God is pleased with you. It is actually an expression of his joy. And that's why 1 Peter 3, 17 says, It is better to suffer for doing good, if this should be God's will, than for doing evil. And so why is God's call on us to suffer? Why is it God's will for us to suffer? Well, here's the fact, and the fact is this. God's plan has always been for us to be like Jesus. God's plan has always been for us to be like Jesus. I call it the Romans 8.29 principle. We just read Romans 8.28, which says what? We know all things work together for good to those who love God and call in accordance to his purpose, right? But Romans 8.29, the verse right after it, provides us the context of things working together for our good. He says, Father God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to be like his son. So why does God work everything together for your good? Because he wants you to be like Jesus. Well, you're saying, well, what's it mean to be like Jesus? Well, Isaiah 53, 3 reminds us, Jesus was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with the deepest grief. Here's where I'm concerned for some of you. Some of you are fighting God's will for your life. Some of you are trying to medicate away your suffering. Some of you are running from your suffering. Some of you are deluding and acting like your suffering's not there. Some of you are pretending that God is good all the time. God is good. And never once acknowledging how, fact, how much life hurts. And I think you may be fighting the control of God. Jesus says in John 15, 20, remember what I told you. A servant isn't greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, but Randy, I thought God wanted to love me. Randy, I thought God wanted to be good to me. Randy, I thought God wanted to bless me. Oh, well, let me share with you a truth that will change your world. The truth is this. Suffering for good is the path to blessing. Suffering for good is the path to blessings. I think some of you like to hear Jesus talk, but you don't ever listen to what Jesus says because notice what he says in Matthew 5, 10, and 12. This is the most impressive, most important, most valuable sermon in the world. And notice what he says. Father, God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. Now notice what he says there. Suffering for good is the path for blessings. He gives us a twofold blessing. He says we're going to be blessed here. It says God blesses, that means now. And we're going to be blessed in heaven. A great reward awaits you in heaven. You're saying, Randy, why is God going to bless me for suffering for doing good? Why? Because it makes us like Jesus. Suffering for good, when you suffer for good, you're never more like Jesus than when you do that. And guess what happens to Jesus? You want to know what that future reward looks like for you? You want to know what that present blessing looks like for you? Well, it says in Isaiah 53, 11 and 12, Father God declares, after Jesus' soul had suffered many things, he will see life and be satisfied. For this reason, I will make him a great man among people, and he will share in all things with those who are strong. Oh, may the evil one stop deceiving you. Stop deceiving you. Why? Because you're thinking somehow that your suffering means God's mad at you. So you're, you're thinking that your suffering means that God is against you. You think that your suffering somehow means that you have missed out on God's will for your life. No. No. God, suffering for doing good 
is the pathway to blessing. You, how many of you are going to walk out here and say, I want God to bless me? Well, guess what? When you say, I want God to bless me, you're saying, I want to suffer. And so why does God let bad things happen to good people? Why? Because he knows the big picture. Why does God let things, bad things happen to good people? Because God wants us to be like Jesus. Oh, but don't miss the third one. If somebody's asleep beside you, wake Chad up. We don't want to miss this. And by the way, just in case you're wondering, I can't see anything. Chad could be standing up doing cartwheels right now, and I wouldn't know it. All I, <laughs> all I can see are these pretty purple flowers, and that's it. I'm done. I, I've been preaching to flowers the whole day. I'm not mad at you. I'm mad at the flowers. So why does let God let bad things happen to good people? Why? Number three, God knows the end of our story. God knows the end of our story. Man, if I was suffering today, and I am. If I was some of you and I was suffering like y'all are suffering. And you're only suffering because your family's mad at you because you're no longer a loser like they are. You're suffering because, you know what? Uh, everybody else around you wants to do stupid stuff. And you're like, nah. Uh, I'm going to do a bachelor party and be home by 9 p.m. Some of you right now, you're suffering because people are upset with you because you set good boundaries. And you're saying, you know what? Boundaries are nothing like a good fence. All a good boundary does is says, hey, if you act like an idiot, I'm not letting you near me anymore. And you're suffering for it because people are talking about you, right? They're running their mouths about you. But if that was me today, then 2 Corinthians 4.17 might be my next tattoo. 2 Corinthians 4.17 might go on my refrigerator, might want to go into my mirror. Why? This is what he says in 2 Corinthians 4.17. He says, for our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. What's he saying there? He's saying, oh, okay, yeah, you suffering. He didn't deny the reality of our suffering. He said, but it's going to produce a glory for you that is so much better, so much bigger than what you're going through, and it lasts forever, and we know suffering doesn't unless you're going to hell. Now, if glory is what God gives us when we suffer for doing what's right, we best want to know what glory means. So what is the definition of glory? Glory is honor, praise, and excellence. We see the same word in Romans 9, 23. It says, Father God does this to make the riches of his glory shine even brighter on those to whom he shows mercy. And so what is he saying there in 2 Corinthians 4, 17? That God gives rich honor, rich praise, rich excellence to us who suffer for Jesus. But I know what you're doing. You're not receiving it. You want to know why nobody said amen there? Because of this fact, and the fact is this. Our present troubles don't feel very small. Our present troubles with our husband. Our present troubles with our finances. Our present troubles in our job. Our present troubles don't feel very small. I mean, go back to the beginning. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 says, For our present troubles are small, it won't last very long. Now, here's the thing, though. Let me help you. Have you ever wondered what present troubles he was talking about there in that verse? Have you ever looked up the present troubles? I did. Ready? Here, there. Here's what he's, when he says our present troubles are small and won't last very long, this is what he says. These are the present troubles. 2 Corinthians 11, 25, and 27 gives us a hint. It says, three times I was beaten with rod. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and day adrift at sea. I have worked hard and long, endured many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. And if that was not bad enough, Hebrews 11, 36, and 37 talks some more about this present troubles that are small and won't last very long. It says, some Christians were laughed at and beaten. Others were put in chain and thrown into prison. They were stoned to death. They were cut in half. They were killed with swords. They were poor, abused, and treated badly. Go back to my mama. Blind for 25 years. In daily pain. You're saying, Randy, why does she have 14 surgeries on her back if they didn't work? This is what she told me. She says, Randy, if you ever hurt every day, 24 hours a day, every minute, every moment, 
He'll try anything to escape. Now think about that. God calls that what my mama went through. God calls Hebrews 11, 36 and 37. God calls 2 Corinthians 11, 25 and 27. He calls that small and short. Now, is he crazy? Is God a fool? Is God nuts? Is God just not able to relate to us? No, here's the truth, and the truth is this. Heaven is so amazing that everything else seems small. Heaven is so amazing that everything else seems small. You say, Randy, what is heaven like? Well, we see from Scripture, look there on your sheet, that heaven, in heaven, the paradise of the Garden of Eden is restored. The water of life flows freely, and the tree of life is available once again. We see that in Revelation 22, 1 and 2. By the way, heaven is a place of no mores. What do you mean by no mores? There will be no more tears, pain, sorrow, and death. We see that in Revelation 21 and 20. Heaven is also a place of great rewards. It's also a great of place of great treasures. Heaven is also the place where... I get a new body. My mama got a new body. And we also get a new home. The old timers call it a mansion. But can I tell you the best part of heaven? According to 1 John 3 and 2. The best part of heaven is we will be able to see Jesus face to face. You say, Randy, that don't mean much to me. Well, maybe this example will help. Everybody knows that mama loved me best. <laughs> By the end of her life, she was admitting that she'd even try to fight it. And this would be what would happen. She would be suffering. She would be hurting. She would be in agony. I would walk into her hospital room and that face that was marred with pain and agony and suffering would light up. There would be joy. There would be light in those blind eyes. Why? Because I was somebody her soul loved. Can I tell you something? You might not know it. I still remember the first time I saw Jennifer with the eyes of my heart. And I had no idea that my soul had been loving her before I even met her. Take that, multiply it by a billion. And that's what it's going to feel like when you see Jesus. He is the one that your soul loves. He is the one that everybody else that you love is just a glimpse of. And you see, heaven is so amazing that God is not downplaying what you're going through. Some of you have been suffering for decades. Some of you have been suffering for years. Some of you have been suffering for months. But this is what 2 Corinthians 4, 17, this is why I say it should be tattooed or put up somewhere on your picture. Put the scale on the thing. What 2 Corinthians 4, 2 Corinthians is saying is this. God is placing all of your suffering here. But he's placing all of God, heaven's blessings there. And he's saying that there's no comparison. It goes like this. It breaks the scale. Do you know what my mama used to say to me all the time? When I'd sit there and hold her arthritis hands that were so gnarled that she couldn't make a fist. She said, and I'd tell her, I'm so sorry that you're hurting. And she'd say, Randy, 15 minutes after I get to heaven, I'm going to forgot all of this. So where are you at today? Are you in the midst of suffering? 
Maybe your name's not Job. Maybe you're not this blind dude. Maybe you're not my mom, but you're, you're suffering. And I hope you hear me. I am trying not to minimize your suffering. I really don't. All I'm saying is, God is so good, and heaven is so amazing, that, think about it, you may suffer for a hundred years straight, but heaven is forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. So do me a favor. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? Every head, every head bowed and every eye closed. Can I give you another reason God lets bad things happen to us? God wants to use your suffering to get you born again. You're saying, Randy, how do you know that? I think about the thief on the cross. The thief on the cross walked into that. You, I don't know if you know this, but two other people died with Jesus that first Easter. And one thief, he went in there, and he thought he was better than Jesus. He was mocking Jesus. He was making fun of Jesus. He thought he was right. He thought he was great. He just thought he was mistreated. But then he got smacked. And then he got nailed. And then he got pierced. And then he suffered for hours. And God used that suffering to bring him to salvation. And that same day, the man who had started the day on the cross ended it in glory. He started the day on the cross and he ended it in heaven. Why? Because God had taken something awful, horrendous, and used it to bring him to salvation. Can I share something with you? I have yet to meet a human being that has ever been born again, saved, surrendered their life to, to Jesus. I've never met a, a human being who has done that because they were blessed. We are so stubborn, we are so hard-headed, the only way we even consider salvation, the only way we even consider surrender, the only way we consider being born again is because we're so sick and tired of the suffering that we're going through that we give up. Is that you today? Please don't waste your suffering. Please don't waste your suffering. Oh, hear me, it can get worse. Please don't waste it. But today, you're saying, Randy, I... I, I believe in God. I don't care. I really don't. When Jesus, when given the opportunity to talk about what it means to be a Christian, said, you must be born again. Have you ever been born again? And tell, pr trust me, your family would know. Your neighbors would know. Your old boyfriends and girlfriends would know. Have you been born again? Have you surrendered control of your heart and life? He kills the old you, gives you a new heart. He makes all things new. He forgives the sin, and he gives you new life. Have you been born again? Oh, please don't waste your suffering. And some of you, you say you've been trying to get saved. But you know and I know you are not born again. I'm going to tell you again like I've told you before. Keep trying till you get it right. Maybe today is the day that God wants to save you. Maybe today you call upon the name of the Lord and he knows that you finally mean what you say and he'll give you a new heart and a new life and you can be born again. Let me pray for you. Dear God, I just thank you. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. Lord, I thank you. That, Lord, you use the hammer more than you use the flower. And, Lord, there are people here today that you have been hammering on. You have been trying to bring them to the point of their salvation. You've, been, you've reasoned with them. You've given them all the evidence that they need. You've given them all the truth that they need. They know. They know. It's not a question of knowing. It's a question of doing. Lord, today, may today be their day of their salvation. May today be the day that they're born again. May today be the day that they get light in their eyes and a spring in their step. May today be the day where they are changed from the inside out. 
God, I pray for our children over in the children's place. We got depraved children that are walking around acting like church kids, and church kids go to hell. Lord, I pray for the salvation of our lost kids. I pray that they'll turn to you. Give their parents enough love for them to fast and pray, to pray for their children's salvation so that one day they might receive you. Oh, Lord, be with us now. You know we've got some work to do. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.